Colossians chapter 2 and verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. For those at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. For a few minutes, I'll talk to you uh, about the title, or I will title my thoughts, Unseen Faces. Unseen Faces. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Father, that someone reached for me before they ever knew me. Thank you, Lord, that I am with people that have dedicated a Friday night, but not only a single night of their year, but every day of their lives to the establishment of And I pray in your name, Jesus, now that you would speak to these simple words a simple man, but Lord, let it be received into the heart of every individual that as we leave this house, our lives would be changed and transformed by the power of the name of Jesus. And everybody said, in Jesus' name, thank you for standing. You may be seated in his presence. It was no doubt a cool September day in 1982 that a plane lifted from Portland, Oregon's International Airport with the destination of Boston, Massachusetts. Inside the plane were many passengers, but the ones I speak of tonight were myself, my father, and, and my mother. We would only be in Boston for a short layover, we would then continue our journey, boarding a plane for Frankfurt, Germany. My parents had been approved as associates in missions, workers, and would be working in Kaiserslautern, Germany. We had left behind us two sets of grandparents, uncles, aunts, and I, I was the only grandchild, the first. My mother was the only daughter and sister. I was the first nephew. My father, prior to leaving, had been selling real estate. He was the number two listing agent in Portland, Oregon. Uh, a year and a half prior to taking off on that September day in 1982, he had had my mother's dream home custom built. Life was, was going very well. In the ministry, Dad was succeeding. He held the title of assistant pastor to what at the time was the largest church in the Oregon district. He was in a part of the youth committee, had just launched the first youth camp in the Oregon district. Uh, all agree, even to this day, that he would have been the next Oregon district youth president, would have pastored the church there, in uh, Aloha, Beaverton area, a good church, a large church. Life was great in ministry. Life was great close to family. Life was great all the way around financially. But dad was conflicted. There was an inner fight in my father. And as they took off, my mother is very nervous flying. She has an intense fear of flying. Praise the Lord. Oh, that makes me sound much more manly. Thank you so much for the manly microphone. I was wondering, why do I sound like that? I, I knew I was much manlier than that. My mother was fearful to fly. She still is. She, she believes that if she holds on to the knee of the passenger next to her hard enough, the plane surely will not crash. So I always wear braces around my knees. And at the time, I was just 17 months old, and she held me in her lap. She was seven months pregnant at the time with my sister. She tells me she wondered what it would, have been like, what it would be like to give birth to her daughter in another country, one in which she had never been. 
She'd never flown on an airplane, much, lived in a, much less given birth to a child in another country. She knew the doctors there would not speak her language, and the medicine may not be as modern. What would it be like to not have her mom and her brothers and sister-in-laws there to celebrate and to help with her young son, Matthew? But my mother was conflicted. There was a fight inside of her. It was something neither of them could escape. It was not for people they knew or even the community in which they lived at the time or faces they saw every day, but as they closed their eyes, there were faces they had not seen whose eyes were hollow, names they could not pronounce, and they lost sleep over it. They couldn't eat, they couldn't sleep, and they knew, mom and dad knew, we must go. And so my dad turned in his resignation at the real estate company. And they told him he was crazy. How are you going to pay for this conflict, Mike? How, where's the money going to come from? They wondered. He must have wondered, how, how will I raise children on a different continent? And how will I, I communicate with people? Will my kids grow up? not knowing their family? Will my wife resent me for taking me from her family? And these are the questions that conflicted my father and these are the questions that conflicted people only have one answer for and it's simply God will provide. And as much inner conflict as my father felt, the conflict of staying was less than the conflict of the unseen faces. Few people knew Mike and Diana Tuttle. They were not the elite of Pentecost. My dad's father was a diesel mechanic and a potato farmer. My mother's father, uh, he's illiterate. He could neither write or read. Her mother, which is my grandmother, baked cakes for a living, she taught at the Christian school. They lived in a 700 square foot home until the day he died. So my dad sold the custom home. He gave his furniture away. And there they stood 36 years ago with a seven month pregnant wife, 17 month old little boy. No money, no financial support long term, no plan, no internet. No cell phone, no guarantees, conflicted for unseen faces. Over 50 people stood at the airport, family and friends watched in awe. Tears flowed, hugs were repeated over and over again. Finally, the boarding process concluded and the final call was made. And they walked their little family down into the plane, no contracts, no guarantees, just a call for unseen faces. When they landed in Germany, my mother wanted to call home. Someone had given them these MCI calling cards. She dialed the number and my grandmother answered. And just a minute in, she heard a loud click Soon she learned that every click was meant. She had been on the phone for one minute, and one minute cost $6. So we didn't call home only on Christmas and on birthdays. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have FaceTime growing up. We didn't have Twitter, emails. Flying back to the United States, we do it now back and forth all the time, but then it was $3,000 a ticket. You stayed five years at a time. It, took a, it would take four weeks to get a letter back from my friends. People would send care packages every once in a while. Y'all probably did that back in the day. They'd have packages of Kool-Aid. And they'd put in American bubble gum. It, took, it came across on a boat, so months later it would arrive, having been in all kinds of temperatures... And I would peel those gum, and I would chew that 
I don't know if I was chewing gum or aluminum foil, but it was great joy. I remember as a boy when we got, finally got cornflakes at the grocery store. My mother would make granola cereal. I remember the first McDonald's opening within driving distance of our home. It was an hour away. And we would go there for my birthday. And then I remember when I was nine years old, we came home to America for the first time. It was the greatest day of my life outside of the Holy Ghost. I, unlike you, I can remember the first time I tasted Mountain Dew. I remember the first time I tasted root beer and Dr. Pepper. I, I can remember landing in New York. I was nine years old. And um, we, were, we had a long layover. And there was this glorious place called a food court. <laughs> and... And I remember being there, and, and I ordered whatever it was, and the gentleman handed me a cup that was empty. And I, I, I remember looking at my father. I said, what do I do? And he pointed me to a fountain from which floweth. <laughs> I'd never seen one. I'd never participated in this wonderful, wonderful experience. I held my cup up. I saw the words, root beer. I said, Dad, we're not allowed to have root beer. That's, he said, no, no, in America, even the beer is saved. I said, wow. This is a wonderful land. And so I filled my cup and I drank it all without breathing. Just, I took it. And my dad said, you can fill it again. I said, what? He said, fill it as many times as you want. I don't know how many times I filled it, but I tried every drink that came out of the fountain. Fruit Loops, Captain Crunch. My mother had told my grandmother, don't let him have any of the American cereals while he's at the house. I don't want him to, my kids to get used to that. That's one more thing they'll miss when we're on the mission field because we didn't have all this stuff. And I remember I walked in, my grandmother opened up the cupboards and she had every kind of sugar. She said, I'm not going to rob my grandchildren from getting to eat uh, Captain Crunch. And they're going to eat it every day that they're at my house. Oh, I love my grandmother. <laughs> I love my grandmother. To this day, she's still alive, this grandmother is. Wendy's, Dairy Queen, Burger King, free refills, just eating at restaurants. Paying with dollars, air conditioning in our cars, air conditioning in our homes, and then the feeling of freedom that America has. Parking my car and our car in, in the driveway that was our own. People that would speak English. It was my language. I remember the size of our grocery carts. They're huge. You don't realize how big and blessed we are. The smell. America's got a smell. It really does. Then I remember going to church. There weren't seven people or eight. There were 200 people. And they were all just like me. Youth groups and youth camps. Camp meetings and conferences. I didn't like being a missionary's kid. I know, all, I know everybody else fakes it. Oh, I love being a missionary kid. I didn't. I wanted to live in America. I would cry in Holland. I would cry, Dad, I want, I want, to, I want to go home. I, I mean, our church was small. The weather was cold. The peer pressure was heavy. And I would beg, Dad, let's go back to the USA. I want to go back to America. And I remember, I remember one night, set, I was crying. I don't know how old it was, 12, 13, missing my family and friends. Dad sat on the edge of the bed. He said, Matthew, if we go back, who's going to tell all these people about Jesus? And I said, 
I don't care. I want Mountain Dew. <laughs> I didn't understand. But I understand now. It was a conflict inside of him. What are you fighting for, Mike? I'm fighting. I can hear my dad say it. I'm fighting for people. I don't know their names. I don't know their history. They, they're probably, they've never seen me and I've never seen them, but I could hear it as he preached. And usually he was preaching to me and mom and my sister and a few other people. But, but, but I want them. I want them. I, why? Why, Mike? Why all of this? Why all this sacrifice? Why putting up with your teenage son that doesn't want to be here? Why the financial burden? Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul said, he said, I was conflicted that that their hearts, uh, Colossians 2 and 2, I want you to see it right here, because here's the answer uh, to why they were conflicted. He says, I was conflicted uh, that their hearts might be comforted. Uh, he said, I was conflicted uh, so that they could be comforted. Let me tell you something today, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, the reason that we are comfortable uh, here today uh, is because someone was conflicted for us. I know, I know you walked in and sat down on a padded pew and you got to choose whether or not you got to raise your hand in the worship session and you got to choose whether or not you'd stand up and enjoy the comfort of an air-conditioned padded pew, carpeted building with multiple instruments. But before you ever got here, somebody didn't get to choose. There was a man that walked into this city that didn't get to choose every time he came to church. He had to be uncomfortable enough to lift his hands. He had to lift his voice. He had to get down and pray. Somebody, somebody sacrificed. Somebody gave. They, they ran a bus route. They taught you a Bible study. They picked you up. Hey, and the comforts that I have that they had were left so that you, the face they had never seen, could be comforted. I know we have great meetings, but if we meet and we never lose any sleep, we're not conflicted by unseen faces. This, my friends, is, is for a people we cannot see yet. Pastor, Pastor Wilmoth, why a missions conference? Why are you pushing us to pray? Why are you pushing us to give? Why are you pushing us to update the building? Why are you pushing me to get involved in the ministry fair? I, can't we just sit back? Can't we just be comfortable? No, we can't be comfortable because somebody needs to be comforted. Pastor, I want to be comfortable. No, 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 no. You, I'm haunted. Come on, I know it's in him. I can tell. Come on, that's why I flew all the way from Houston. I don't just fly for one meeting to preach anywhere. But for men that I know that are conflicted for the lost, I, I, I link up with them. There's like precious faith and commonality of purpose. That's what this meeting's about. This is about people that are lost. It wakes us up in the middle of the night. I said it ought to keep you up in the middle of the night. We got to do everything we can. We got to do everything we can. And as long as there is a night, as long as there is a night, I must stand and declare, come on somebody, as long as there is light, I'll declare a night is coming. But there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. Let me not be satisfied, but my heart be stirred. As they that were conflicted for me, I too would be conflicted for them. And I know we have good meetings. But, but if we meet and we have times that we don't eat, we're not conflicted for unseen faces. I know you get sick and 
I know we pray and I know we fast for our family. And you pray and you fast for your miracle and you pray and fast for your blessing. But when's the last time we prayed and fasted for unseen faces? I need to be moved. What's driving you, Pastor Wilmoth? I know it's not your title of pastor. What's pushing you, Pastor? I know it's not your position as a leader. But the passion, it's not the pay. The passion is not the house I see. It's not the car I see. It's not, it has nothing to do with what I see, but what drives me is what I've never seen. It's people I do not know uh, walking down the streets uh, of Red, of California, that little boys and girls that they don't know. Some are black, some are white, some are brown, some are rich, some are poor. They live in Africa and Asia. They live in Europe. They live down the street. They live in my community. I don't know them. I, I, can't, I can't name them. But I, I'm haunted by the fact they're lost. And I hold the key of comfort. My dear friends, this this place is not one where we come just, just to feel good and see each other. The mission of the church, although it's 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 in modern Christianity is convoluting it and turning the house of God into a social justice center. And the church is now brag about all the social justice we are doing and all the good we're doing in society. And I'm not opposed to that. Let us not forget the poor we're going to have with us always. The church cannot solve world poverty. Come on, I don't care how many selfie pictures and YouTube videos you post of yourself helping people. Good, 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 and you need to help people. But the greatest gift, and come on, and I'm coming from a place where, come on, I've had my whole city flood twice now. I'm coming from, but I, I, what I can give people and what I'm called to give people is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us not deviate from our mission. Let us not become distracted by the fact, come on, you can't feed every starving man but you can give every starving soul. I can't feed your stomach, Bubba, but I can give you, I can give you Jesus. This is about pulling people from a damnable hell and getting them into heaven. This is about preaching unto them uh, the death of Jesus Christ in repentance, uh, the burial in the baptism waters of Jesus' name, uh, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, uh, the resurrection to newness of life. This is about preaching uh, sanctification and that there's a life that's greater than the one they're living. Uh, This is about, that's what this thing's about. That's what this conference is about. That's what the church is all about. Woo! Come on, hey. Church isn't here to pay your rent. Church isn't here to, no, they're not. They're not here to get you a car. The church isn't here as a lottery station. This, come on, this is the church, and it's here to get you to heaven. I don't know their names and I don't know what they look like but but they're going to be we will know them and they'll come into this place and I know they'll come broken so I pray Lord let me be conflicted so someone can be comforted let me be conflicted as someone was conflicted for me so let me be conflicted for them that they might experience the power of the Holy Ghost Thank you for indulging me as I share my, the story. And, and in 84, my parents, mom and dad, were appointed to the Netherlands. They, 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 I'm going to tell you why they went. Because they were asked to go. There was no angel. I asked my dad once, I said, have you ever seen an angel? He said, well, I think maybe one time, I think. He said, but I'm, I'm not sure. It could have just... Just been, I don't know. 
a homeless man or something. You know, some people, they, 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 won't, they won't do nothing unless they, an angel speaks to them. Their pastor has to beg them 37 times. But somebody just said there's a need. There's, there's people in a country. There's, there's a need. And, and all they did was, all that happened was the need was presented. But there was something inside of them that was conflicted. And it said, you know what? I don't have to feel it to do it. Well, I just don't, I just don't feel, hey, Jesus didn't feel like going to Calvary, but thank God he didn't base your eternal salvation on his temporary feelings. Well, pastor, I just need to pray about it and see if it's God's will for me to be on the outreach team. I know you've asked me. No, 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 no. If the need has been presented, it's God's will for you to be in it. When, come on, minister, you don't have to go home and pray about which ministry. You just go and get involved in all of them. I said get involved in all of them. Get, his, get, get your time filled up. You say, hey, pastor, you want to you wanna do the will? I'm off my notes. But you want to really find the will of God, go up to pastor and say, tell me what to do, anything you tell me where to go. Come on, somebody. If my life can matter in eternity, that's all that matters. I said, if my life can matter in eternity, that's all that matters. We planted churches. We planted churches. We, we didn't have, we didn't have, we did it the old fashioned way. We didn't have three months to do a lawn service. I'm not against that. We didn't have the money to give away bikes. Good Lord, if they're giving away bikes, I would have taken my own bike. We didn't have iPads to give away or fruit snacks, none of that. We had enough money. We rented a little community center. Sheets for Christ gave my dad some money once we were fully appointed. And I saw other missionaries buying these family cars. My dad bought a nine-passenger van. We were the least cool family in the neighborhood. And we're driving this nine-passenger van carry people to church and we'd knock on doors and pass out tracks and be on the side of the street. I got, I put some, hey, back in the day, y'all, anybody remember when we had slides as missionaries? Mess, uh, I brought some slides. Okay. Let's just be old fashioned. I like it anyway. That's my mom and dad. And you're like, oh, I don't know your mom and dad. I don't care if you know him or not. Hey, you don't know LeBron James and you get excited about some sports star that's all, you, hey, let me just put it this way. He's, these are way, way better people than any basketball player. These are way better than any, any, any kind of football player that you got hanging on your wall worshiping. You don't know them either, but you stand and clap and get excited about their statistics. Here's some statistics that altered eternity. That's my mom. That's my dad. Next slide, and he'd go out, and Dad would. That's a man that was a millionaire in the 80s. He sold everything he had to go over to a street corner. There he is. This is a young man in the early 90s, and he's passing out. You know, he's passing out. Who is that lady he's passing? I don't know who she is. She never came. She's one of hundreds of thousands of people that he invited to come. That's one of the faces that kept him awake at night. That's one of the people that he said, I got to go. I got to go. Go to the next slide. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. We did it all. That's my, that's my grandmother. She'd come over and help us go. I just put some pictures together. I don't know what I got. There's my dad again. There's, that's hero. Young people, that's a hero. I'm so sick and tired of this garbage that people we call heroes. Those are heroes. Passing out tracks. We did it all. My dad got a job working as a volunteer just so he could meet people and learn language school and to meet people. And people, people started coming. From the language school, Kayon Davis came. And, and she was from Jamaica. She got the Holy Ghost. And, and, and then she got baptized. And, and, and she had a friend named Yeshua. And Yeshua was from Ethiopia. So we taught Yeshua a Bible study. She got the Holy 
Ghost and, and she got baptized and, 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 and then we talked to uh, Reginald and Reginald got the Holy Ghost and, and he got baptized and then we talked to Orlando what are you saying I'm saying if you'll get out and do it they'll get in if you'll just get uncomfortable you can change your world Come on, the son of a potato farmer and an illiterate man's child produced a hero. Because they said, I'm not satisfied. Oh, we taught Bible studies. Keep going through my little slide. We taught Bible. There he is. Oh, man, there he is. Oh, we'd have, we'd have, we'd, we'd have street side services. And, and I'm telling you, it, 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 they, they would, they'd make fun of us. They'd laugh at us. They'd mock us. They, they would take the, 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 we had flyer. Dad would print literally 10,000 flyers at a time. All kinds of catchy little phrases. If being born once hasn't given you satisfaction, try being born again. Free English lessons. And then he'd preach to them in English. You know, anything he could think of. He'd print up 10,000 at a time. And we'd go out and we'd stand out. And as soon as we got a group big enough, there, see that man playing the clarinet? That's my dad. See the ladies playing the, one of them's my mother. Playing that, they weren't that good at it. Uh, they laughed at us. They made fun of us. Uh, but there were some, there were some that will not burn in eternity forever because a man said, I'm willing to be uncomfortable for faces I cannot see. Bible study. There's Bible study. I remember when the, one of those ladies got the Holy Ghost there. Some of them are sisters. That's that dad teaching a Bible study. Every night of the week he taught a Bible study, except family night. He would, he would teach a Bible study. Uh, he, he would ride a bike. He would take trains. He would ride the, 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 the bus. Uh, the, the She's for Christ fan. Dad couldn't speak Dutch, so I was the translator. So every night I was out, and we were teaching Bible studies in the living room. Uh, and, and, and I remember that lady right there uh, next to the lady in the green uh, in, in one of those Bible studies, in that room, I'll never forget it. I was, I'm sitting over here in the right. Uh, guess what? All of a sudden, she started speaking with other tongues uh, as God filled her with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, hey, the girl, lady in the green, a few weeks later, she got the Holy Ghost. Uh, why are you saying, hey, they're not 22 years old. Uh, these are elderly people because our world's hungry. Our world's hungry. Uh, our world's hungry. <laughs> Next slide. Oh, we reached next slide. That's Bible studies. There's more Bible studies. There. They came in. That was our church building, one of them. No, go back. Go back. Because, see, we didn't have, we didn't, go back to that one where, where we were in the church building. We didn't have organs and Yamaha. What's this? Whatever it is. Fancy, smancy. It's got more buttons than, I don't even know what to do with these things, you know? They're like, it's unbelievable. Look. Look, they got together and had a baby over here, I guess. I don't know what happened. Look, the, the rolling, you know. It's unbelievable. The drums, they're like, woo, let's put all these drums, let's build a house around our drums, you know, we're just awesome, you know. My, that's us. That's, that's, you see, y'all say, oh, Matt Tuttle preaching at conference. Yeah, yeah, God's opened them some doors because I learned. They didn't have talent. Mom and dad didn't have that much talent. We sure didn't have that much money. They didn't have any fame. They were just conflicted. People they'd never seen before. My mother believed in prayer walks. She just believed you could reach the whole world by walking through town praying all the time. Dad thought, no, the way we're going to do it is we're going to pass out flyers like I told you. So dad would print up 10,000 flyers and mom would have me pray and pass out flyers. We was killing two birds with one stone, the prayer walk and the flyers. She walked and I, I can't remember if I, t I one time, I might have told you this last time, I can't remember what I tell. She, some lady came in and her, we're trying to win her husband's really persecuting her and just giving her a hard time. He's a bar owner. And, and my mom told that lady, she said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to shut his bar down. See, we don't have faith like that nowadays. 
You know what I mean? My mama said, we'll shut the bar down. She said, I remember Claudia said, we're going to shut what? She said, we're going to shut the bar down so he can get saved and stop giving you a hard time. And so, you know what? She, she said, well, how are we going to do it? She said, well, we're going to do a prayer walk, of course, because that's the answer to every problem was prayer walking. Y'all wondering why I'm skinny. Some of y'all need to do some prayer walking, extra walking. We get out there. I'm telling you, we went out. We'd walk around that bar. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Jerry Molema, you're going to be saved. Close this bar down because Jerry needs to be saved. We went out, I don't know how many, weeks, 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 weeks. One day, we, we got out of the van, and guess what? They were putting plywood up on the windows because you know what happened? Jerry came to church. You know what happened? Jerry got the Holy Ghost. You know what happened? Jerry turned into a van driver, and he started bringing people. But it all happened because Mama said, I, I can stay at home in the comforts of my life or I can allow the conflict within me uh, to push me out of the comfort zone for the people I cannot see uh, and I can reach my world. Drug addicts, homosexuals and prostitutes. We, we started, we, we had a, dad bought this three bedroom house and he, uh, three, three, I'm sorry, three bedroom, three story house and upstairs he turned into a drug rehabilitation center. And, and he'd take people that were drugs or legal in Amsterdam and all of Holland. You can, and so he'd get these guys two or three at a time, seven, seven days, prayer, uh, just, just water, fasting and prayer. That was the key. That's our drug rehabilitation center. <laughs> Nowadays, I look at all the lawsuits and why we worry about all these things. You know, oh, they're going to sue us. Dad just literally would take them up there. He would lock them Two or three of them, me and some other dude that he had faith in. I, Jerry or my grandfather one time. Of course, Dad did it several times. Whoever, whoever wanted, hey, you want to be in drug rehabilitation? That meant you're going to go on a seven-day fast. And I remember being up there with them suckers, man, when they're coming detoxing. And it's sick. I never wanted to do drugs. Come on, some of y'all worried about, oh, my kid's going to be a drug addict. because oh, You little snowflake parent. Trying to, you want let them get them involved in soul winning. Let them see the dirty belly of sin. They never. I don't. I've never had the desire for a cigarette. I've never had the desire for any of that garbage. Ever, ever, ever. We had refugee ministry. Drove the van. Had to drive three different times to the refugee boat to bring refugees in. And and and, and we got going. We got. We got Hofdorp going. That's that one you see up there. And then Dad said, we need a church in the South. There's no churches. We're in 17 million people. No churches. So Dad says, well, these people have a church here. Now, where we're at, so we had like seven or eight people there. He's like, we need to start a church in Dordrecht. So that's where he got this house. Miraculously got this house. And it's three stories high. So he puts his drug rehabilitation. That's how we're going to do that. Uh, in, in the middle, he rents it out to students. In the bottom, the bottom level, he knocks out the wall between the kitchen. It's like shotgun house. You know, the kitchen's kind of back here. And the dining room's here. And then the, the living room is here. So he knocked out all those walls. And he, uh, he, 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 he that, that was the sanctuary. It was crazy. We would have to get up like at 5 o'clock in the morning to get ready because it was about an hour and a half from the place we lived to Dordrecht. So we'd get up on Sunday about, oh, 5, get, leave about, I don't know, 6, because we had to get there early enough to drive the van to do the bus route for the first church. So we'd run the first church bus route, get all those people, have church in our little house church, and, and then we would uh, have to take them all home. And, and then on the way home, hey, we started having revival. We reached somebody in the city of The Hague, which was halfway on the way home, back to the, the last church service we started at 6. So Dad said, well, we could have church in The Hague on the way home. So we had church, so we, we started that about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So we had 1 at 10 in the morning. We had 1 at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So we had to pick up people in the head. It was a hassle. I know now we cancel all the services. You know, Sunday night, everybody, I don't know what y'all do here, but we don't have enough, to, oh, revival Monday, Tuesday. Oh, we're, we're all so busy. Hey, no, we're not so busy. We're just comfortable. Finally, the one o'clock service would end. We'd drive back 
30 minutes or so to Hofdorp, Amsterdam area. We'd have our five, or I can't remember if it was five or six o'clock service. By the time we got home and did all those bus routes and all those people, it would be seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock. I'd be late and you'd fall. I mean, there ain't no tired like a Sunday night, three service. And I'm not talking you came into padded pews. You set it up every time, service. And I was right there, hey, head janitor, head whatever he appointed me to that Sunday. I might be leading service. I might be singing. So I, whatever I was told to do, I had to do. So before you get up, so, oh, Brother Tuttle must have politicked his way up to that platform. No, baby. I swept floors up onto this platform. I, 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 I did a lot of hard work, Bubba. <laughs> And I had school the next morning. And guess what? I survived. <laughs> I survived. Well, Brother Tuttle, I got to get Johnny home, you know. I can't come to Sunday night church. I can't come to Monday night prayer. I can't come to Wednesday night service because I got to get, I got to get Susie. He's going to, Susie's going to be all right. She, 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 she might get a B in history instead of an A. But I told my kids, I'm fine with you getting a B in history as long as you get an A in heaven. You, you can get a C in health, but I'm not going to let you miss heaven. You, you go ahead. Hey. 3.8 GPA, fine with that. I'm okay. But you're going to get a 4.0 in Holy Ghost. You're going to know all of because baby, I don't care. You, you, you fight so hard to get your kids to a school system that promotes immorality and you withhold them from the thing that promotes godliness. Hey, friend, the it's a question of comfort and conflict. They'd come by and throw rocks at the church. We'd pass out flyers. They'd rip them in, in my face. So I had one guy put it in his mouth, spit it out on me. The Muslims would send their little kids, the wonderful religion of peace would send their kids into our church. They would just send them in to disturb. They would scream and run all over the place. They would, we had to put bars on the windows because they kept breaking into the church. They graffitis our sign. They, they, they constantly, constantly, constantly. But we just kept on because there were some unseen faces. My dad never took me hunting. I've never been hunting with my father. He never took me fishing, at least not for fish. But boy, I don't have a clue how to catch a redfish, a big mouth bass. I can't tell the difference between a big mouth or a small mouth bass. They both kind of look the same to me. I'm like, that's a, they look like a fish. But you put an exploring God's word or a search for truth in my hand, in Dutch or English, you give me into his marvelous light. Matter of fact, you don't need, just give me a Bible. Give me two less times. And if they're hungry, they'll get the Holy Ghost. And if they need it, I can pray them through. Oh, no, I never caught a fish. But I was 12 years old when I prayed for a man that was deaf and his ears came unpopped. I, I was standing right there when a lady was dead but got raised back to life. Well, we need more family time. Hey, baby, I made it the best family time. The best fishing is when you're fishing for the lost. And when, oh, you want to have fun with your boy? Win a soul with him. Hey, mama, you want to get close to your daughter? Let her see you have a hunger for the lost. And guess what? Matthew Tuttle, we didn't go to Disneyland and Disney World. We didn't have multi-million dollar vacations. We didn't go on 
vacation. You know what? We want souls. And I'm living for God. My sister's living for God. We made it. Your kids are going to be okay. Get them in the church. Get them in the thing of God. study with someone blowing smoke in their face. Get them in a Bible study where the TV's blasting and somebody's drunk. Get them in a place where they see you get cussed out but hold your composure. And you know what? You'll become their hero. <laughs> and, a lot, and most of the eyes that met him left him. Most of the people he taught didn't come. But two little eyes of a little boy. Me. Paul said, I know I've been preaching. I'm sorry. I normally am done by now. Hey, here he is. That, that, you remember the kitchen I told you that got busted out? Okay, he dug a hole in the floor and tiled it. Okay, so the, this, is under, this is underneath, and he put a, and then, so what you would do to baptize somebody, our platform was about this big, you know, and there, it was a lid, huh. And you could go down and you could lift it up, lift it up like this. And then you were looking into that right there. That's the baptismal tank. <laughs> and he tiled it because he already had the plumbing there because the kitchen was right there. And he just put tile, and he'd fill it up. And there, there's Eric Vinklar. He got baptized in Jesus' name. Hey, guess what? That was an unseen face that now is a pastor of that church I just showed you. And they don't have eight people anymore. Uh, they're bumping a hundred people today. Why? Because one man, the son of a potato farmer, said, I can make a difference. Paul said in Colossians 2.8, he said, I, and I understand the context of the passage of Scripture, but in the context of what I'm saying, he says, beware lest any man spoil you. Yes. I know we like to talk about the, the doctrine that he's speaking of there, vain doctrines, but, but I've come to warn, beware, hope sinner. Lest you become so spoiled. Lest you get so spoiled. My concern with the American church is not the abundance or the lack of blessing. We're blessed. Matter of fact, I think we're past the point of being blessed. We're to the place of being spoiled. Yeah, we are. We're being spoiled. We're so spoiled. You ever met a kid that's spoiled? You ever met a kid? Nobody likes the spoiled kid. Because it all revolves around them. Well, pastor, what does your church have to offer? It's in Pentecost. The people, I got people in my area. They'll change churches just because I didn't sing the song they liked. I'll go find me another Pentecostal. I look, I had one of them come to me. They were leaving over some idiotic thing. I said, you're so lucky you get to live in this country where you can be a picky Pentecostal. I said, if you were in Holland where I grew up, you either went to our church or went to hell. That should kind of be your opinion about your church. If they, the only reason you quit is if they stop preaching one God, Jesus' name, and holiness living. If they want to, come on, if they want to paint the walls in you, let them paint the walls. If they want to sing songs on the screen, yippity doo da day. Who cares? We come on, somebody. I'm in it. I'm in it. See, y'all got uncomfortable right there. Little, little patty cake clap, you know. Because we're talking about being spoiled Because we know we are yes. But I'm thankful I'm thankful for men and women of God Amen yes. I feel the Holy Ghost I said I feel the Holy Ghost Hey, 
hey, the time has come for us to stop living like kings and giving like paupers. It's okay to be blessed. I'm blessed. But I give between, I don't know, I don't matter what I give, but I don't tell you how much, but I made up my mind. What I give to missions will be greater than my house payment. I just, I just, I figure it's the least I can do when I look at those pictures of my daddy. He didn't just give up a house payment. He gave up the whole house. Come on, somebody. And I can, oh, look across there. Hey, look, see the lady right there with the bun on the back of her head with her head. head. See that? That's Bea. I remember when Bea came to church, she was, I'm done. I'll close her in a minute. Sorry, Brother Wilmoth. I just, I don't know. I just kind of felt like somebody needed to be reminded what it's all about. She showed up at she showed up at that house church. See, we after we had revival, we bought this church out of that house church. This is in Dordrecht, and uh, we filled it up. And but I remember she was one of the first twenty or thirty people. She came knocking on the door one day, and she uh, came, we opened up the door early for church. And she said, "Is this the, the Pentecostal church?" And we said, "Yeah, that's why the sign says Pentecostal church." And she said, okay, okay, what time does it start? 10 o'clock, okay, I'll be back. So she comes back with her boyfriend, long-haired guy, and uh, comes in. Dad, after church, says, he says, hey, uh, how, did, how did you hear about our church? Was it a flyer? You know, he's hoping for the flyer. <laughs> you know what I mean? We spent so much money on those things. I don't know if we ever really got people that came because of the flyers, but they came because if you sow in a place, God will, will. Look, some of you are like, well, we just don't need to do that anymore because we're not getting anybody. But you are going to get people. Just keep doing something. Don't, don't stop because, well, they're not coming because we're knocking doors. Keep knocking doors. If you plant, you're going to reap. If you sow it, it's going to come back. She knocked on the door. She comes in. Dad says, how'd you come? She says, well, she said, I found you in the phone book. And dad's like, really? Hmm. He said, well, which phone book? It's called the Chaude Chitz, which means uh, uh, yellow pages. Ha <laughs> ha, imagine that. He said, really? He said, that's so crazy. He says, we don't have a telephone. She said, well, well, it's right. She, said, she pulled out a little post-it thing. She said, well, right here. I wrote the address down right here. He said, well, uh, He's like, I know I haven't paid them anything. He, do you mind bringing, he said, I, he said, she was church, hop, church shopping. And, and he said, do you mind bringing that, just come back one more service and bring that, bring that yellow pages and I want to just see that advertisement. He said, I'll be here tomorrow. I got to come up Monday and do some, some uh, the drug rehabilitation stuff. And so she said, okay, yeah, yeah. So sure enough, man, she comes back the next day, knocking on the door. She got the book in her hand. She says, something's going on. She said, I've, I got home and I opened it up. She said, I, I had the post-it note where I wrote your address down out of the phone book. She said, but I've been all the way through this phone book and you aren't in the phone book. <laughs> That's how she got saved. And I could stand here all night and tell you how that one got saved. She, we found her. I knocked on her door. That lady with the glasses, I knocked on her door and she was laying in her own throw up. Had been laying there for three days, high on heroin and all this junk. But there she is with long uncut hair, life changed. And I've preached the biggest meetings in Pentecost, but nothing's better than that right there. That, and you can do it. You can do it right here in California. You can be in your mission field right here. You sign up at that fair. You find that face that you don't know their name. You get them in a Bible study. You celebrate when they make fun of you. But you keep on. You keep on. You keep on. Because if you will become uncomfortable, they will be comforted. And in verse 10, and I'm done with verse 10. I apologize. I don't normally preach this long. And as they are comforted, the most beautiful thing will happen. As Paul says in verse 
chapter 2, verse 10, he says, and ye are complete. He said, I got uncomfortable so I could comfort you. And then he completed you. And that's what every, that's what the stories are of Kayon Davis. She found completion. That's the story of the New York prostitute in Amsterdam that we found standing on a corner that today is a Sunday school teacher. She became complete in him. That's it is the African lady that was being trafficked, trafficked for sex, but we got her out of it. You know how? She's complete in him. That's the law your dad won because he got the job. Come on, just volunteering for an unseen face. They. There's people that are going to hell tonight. There are people that need a church that's not comfortable on their padded pews, but that's reaching somebody. I challenge you as I close. I wonder if you, come on, as we gather around the front, could close your eyes and you could allow faces. I wonder as your eyes close and your mouth is lifted, if you could see them just for just just see them and, and, and wonder if this altar call could be unlike previous altar calls when you came to the front and you cried out because you needed salvation or you needed healing or your kids or your body or your family or your finance or your future or your purpose but this altar call I wonder if you could make your life uncomfortable for a moment and you could come for absolutely no reason pertaining to yourself but not that need that pertains to the faces you can't see are you still touched are we still burdened are we still driven to our faces by a world that's lost they're around you they check you out at Walmart they bag your groceries they sit next to you on the high school bus. They, they work with you on the shift job. They walk past you on the street. You don't know their names. But what if every walk in your city became a prayer walk? What if you never had a pocket that didn't have a flyer in it? What if you signed up and told a Bible study? Not because you were teaching them how much you knew, but you could show them how much you loved them. And you found that they don't even care how much you know. They're in love. With looking for people that love them. You can love them, Hope Center. You can love them, Southern California. All across the building, eyes are closed. Faces, come on. I was conflicted because you hadn't seen my face. I hope you never get so comfortable. The loss no longer stirs your heart.
calling you to open that door and not to base that number, not to base that time on what fits into your life comfortably, but to make your life uncomfortable, to take up some time that'll cost you some money, that'll take away some of the comforts of our lives so that someone else can find the comforts of eternity. Come on and get you out and listen to his voice. 